So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Bonatier and I'll be uh, Lilima's uh, host today in this uh, Imagine seminar. Uh, we're very happy to have you, Lilima. And uh, um, let me just say a few words about uh, your whereabouts. Uh, you got your PhD in 1999 from the University of Delaware. And then uh, you were the recipient of an IMA industrial postdoc. Um, and after that, you have, you have several positions, and particularly at uh, McGill and uh, at uh, Simon Fraser University, where you're now a full professor. And uh, your uh, field of interest, your topics of interest are PDEs and the numerical analysis of PDEs. And especially, you're looking at uh, spectral problems and scattering problems. And uh, today, uh, you will talk to us about wave enhancement through spectral optimization. And again, welcome and thank you for uh, giving us this talk. Thank you very much, Eric and everyone. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, and please let me know if um, anything cuts out or if you can't hear me. And if you have questions, I'm happy to try and answer them along the way. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is joint work um, with Seema Mary, who is now a postdoc with me at SFU. And he's formerly a student of Habib Amari at ETH Zurich, who is also a collaborator on this, and with Oscar Bruno at Caltech. And what we're trying to achieve here is wave enhancement through spectral optimization. So what I mean by this is um, I'd like to uh, boost the amplitude of a time harmonic wave due to a source at say this blue location here, the source point, which is fixed, at a given receiver point, which is fixed as well, which is in this say red star. So I fix the frequency of the time harmonic wave and I wish to maximize the amplitude of the field at the receiver due to the source. And the way we're going to achieve this maximization or this change is through changing the boundary conditions, which is an unusual sort of optimization. And it has been made physically possible through the um, concept of metamaterial resonators. So these were uh, described, I think, very nicely in a PRL paper in 2015, where you can install, for example, on the boundary of a room, these metasurfaces, which at certain frequencies have the effect of changing a boundary condition from Dirichlet to Neumann. And these were analyzed in a sequence of papers by Habib and his collaborators uh, in 2019. So here's just to give you a visual idea of what I hope to achieve. So on the left, I have a domain and I've placed a source at the point right here in the center where my cursor is. And you can see that if I had directly boundary conditions around the domain, then the field at the receiver, which is up here somewhere, that is quite small. So what I've plotted here is the magnitude of the field due to the source at this point here. However, if I change the boundary conditions, so if I um, impose Neumann boundary conditions, zero Neumann boundary conditions on part of the domain, I can actually quite dramatically change the field. And by choosing the location of the Neumann boundary condition, I can enhance the field at the receiver due to the source quite considerably. So the game here will be to try and move the Neumann parts of the boundary around until I can maximize the gain at the receiver. So the outline of my talk will be to try and describe for you in some detail the model that I'm working with and how spectral optimization comes into play. And in particular, I'll have to tell you where exactly on the boundary to change from zero Dirichlet to zero Neumann boundary conditions. I will end up with a mixed boundary value problem. I'll also have to tell you how long the Neumann section of the boundary has to be. And then I will try and put this all together within a spectral optimization. So uh, pictorially, when I refer to a boundary segment in blue or in light blue, that refers to a Neumann zero boundary condition. And wherever the curve is red, that's where I've imposed zero directly conditions. 
So here's some notation just to fix ideas. I'll be working in uh, planar domains, omega, and they will have boundary gamma. These will be benign domains, so I'm not thinking of anything particularly horrible. Lipschitz is good. I'm going to fix the receiver location, y star. I'm going to fix the source location, x star. And I'm going to fix the target frequency, k star. So all the starred variables in this talk refer to objects which are fixed. I'm going to impose a sound soft boundary condition, which is Derek Clay on the boundary initially. And then I'm going to change pieces of the boundary conditions to sound hard. And wherever I impose the Neumann boundary conditions, I'll call that piece gamma sub n. So the quantity of interest here is uh, what I call the Zaremba function, or it is the Green's function for this mixed boundary value problem. So I'm looking for um, the value or the magnitude of Z sub F at the points X star and Y star. So these two points are fixed. I'm looking for the maximum of the magnitude of ZF where ZF satisfies, well, the Helmholtz operator equals a point source at X star. And on the boundary at gamma N, on the Neumann piece, the normal derivative is zero. And everywhere else, the, normal, the trace of the function is zero. So this is the Green's function. And I'd like to emphasize I'm only interested in its value at the receiver. So I've fixed the source location, and I'm interested in the value at the receiver. And what will change here is where I put the blue piece of the boundary. In other words, my design variable, if you want, is the characteristic function of the location of this Neumann piece. Let's call it f. So the length of this piece can range from 0 to the length of the entire domain. So it could be that at the end of my optimization, I need all of the boundary to be fully Neumann. So the optimal, yes, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, if you allow me, just a question, uh, does it have to be connected? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. I, I think that's a very good question, and I have not yet thought about the multiply connected case, but in principle, many of these techniques should carry on, but it's, right. it's a great question. Thanks. So the optimization that I'm interested in is the following. Um, I have some admissible configurations and the design variable F associated with them. And I'd like to achieve the maximum of the ratio or the gain um, corresponding to the Green's function where I've changed the Neumann data suitably compared to just starting with pure directly. So this is the quantity of interest. And once again, here's the boundary value problem, if you will, that I'm solving for Z sub F. So the initial attack on this problem due to Habib and his collaborators was a so-called one-shot approach, where you not only find the location of where you put the Neumann boundary condition, you also decide how long it's going to be. And it's, it's an approach which works quite well, but it requires a solution of the PDE with different boundary conditions at every step of the objective function calculation. So this is a somewhat expensive calculation, and um, they were interested in something different. So the approach that was suggested um, was actually where the spectral bit of the title comes in. So there's a very nice characterization of the signal, um, Z sub F, in terms of the eigenfunctions of the related problem. So you change the boundary conditions wherever you need to, and then you solve for the eigenfunctions of the Zaremba or the mixed Dirichlet Neumann eigenproblem, where you're looking for the frequencies K or K sub M, depending on how you're counting. You're fixing the normal derivative to be zero on the Neumann part, and you're fixing the directly condition to be zero on the rest. So here you locate both the eigenfunction and the frequency. 
So how are these two problems related? Well, there is this spectral characterization or the decomposition. So the Green's function for the fixed target frequency k squared, provided it's not an interior eigenvalue, uh, you can expand it using the basis functions of the Zaremba eigenvalue problem where you've placed the Neumann piece exactly where you had placed it for the Green's function. So these are right here, the basis functions for the Zaremba problem. In the denominator, you have the target frequency squared minus the eigenvalue squared, and then you sum over all the discrete eigenvalues. So you can see that one way to achieve a maximum for Z sub F at two points X star, Y star, is to, well, make sure that K star and some eigenfrequency KM squared are close. So you can make the denominator small and that would make the sum large. So this was the idea behind what we are going to do. And another ingredient here that's really important is we're going to be starting with a pure Dirichlet boundary condition. And we don't know where to even begin inserting the Neumann pieces. And once we do, we don't really know a priori how changing the length of the Neumann piece is going to affect the spectrum. But this is where there's a very useful spectral monotonicity result that's quite recent. It's um, from 2017. And the statement is the following. So consider the situation where you have a domain and two possible partitions of the boundary. So the partitions are gamma D, gamma N, where you prescribe zero Dirichlet on gamma D and zero Neumann on gamma N. And suppose you had a different partition. So you have gamma D prime and gamma N prime. And suppose moreover that gamma N prime is contained within gamma N. So there is a smaller Neumann content, if you will, in this problem. So provided the, the Dirichlet piece is actually bigger, so the, the set gamma D prime without gamma D has a non-empty interior, then you shift the spectrum down. So the spectrum of this problem, the jth eigenvalue is going to be smaller than the jth eigenvalue here for the mixed problem. So this is what we're going to exploit. And I'm going to try and put on one slide again what we're doing. We're going to compute for a given arrangement of uh, the Neumann and Dirichlet pieces, the eigenpairs of the Zaremba eigen problem. And then provided the target frequency k star or k star squared is not an interior eigenvalue, there holds the spectral decomposition. And we're going to grow the Neumann piece of the boundary so that some eigenvalue, say the nth eigenvalue, will decrease towards the target frequency. So that's going to be the approach. And we're going to try and ensure along the way that case the, the, the source and the receiver aren't actually hitting nodal lines of the eigenfunction, because that might be a problem. If the numerator vanishes, then you're sort of out of luck. But to emphasize again, the quantity that I'm interested in is the value of the Zaremba Green's function, if you will, at x star and y star. These points are fixed. I don't really care about the value of this function anywhere else. So, well, I'm going to be using a numerical approach. So I'll be truncating the spectral characterization at, say, n modes where n is large enough. And my goal is to maximize this object with some eigenfunction and eigenvalue set where the eigenvalue km is close to the fixed target k star. So I can now split the problem into two distinct questions. The first is, where do I start? Where do I place the initial Neumann segment? So I'm going to call this 
question, the nucleation question. Where do I nucleate the Neumann piece to start this maximization? And then once I've got that nucleation point, I'm going to try to grow the length of the Neumann segment, but how long should it be? So the idea would be to use the monotonicity to grow the length of the Neumann piece until an eigenvalue gets close to the target frequency. And that would ensure that this sum gets large. Now, of course, if I'm going to be working with eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, I need to get these eigenvalues and eigenfunctions somehow. And it's um, helpful if you get these eigenvalues and eigenfunctions to some high accuracy. So the approach that we use is a boundary integral approach for the mixed directly Neumann problem. And this was developed in collaboration with Eldar Akhmagaliev and Oscar in 2015. So the pieces, again, will be some kind of a high accuracy computation of these mixed eigenvalues. I will use the monotonicity of these eigenvalues in the growth of the Neumann piece of the boundary. And then uh, a result that I will exploit a fair bit is the asymptotic behavior of the eigenvalues when I change the Dirichlet to Neumann piece just a little bit. All right. So let's start with the nucleation question. Where should I place the Neumann boundary condition? So I start off initially, say, with this with the setup where I have the source in blue, the receiver in, in red, and I have all directly all around. And then I'm going to insert a Neumann piece, let's say in this light blue, and the center of the Neumann piece is going to be location S. So I want to figure out where to place the S. So I'm going to move this little segment of the Neumann boundary condition all around, and I want to see where to place it. So this is a very nice result due to Habib and um, Theme and Wu during uh, their work in 2019, which says the following. So suppose you started with the Green's function. So this is the actual Green's function for the Helmholtz operator at the target frequency with pure directly boundary conditions. Okay. So this is just one calculation. You figure out the Green's function on the domain with that frequency with zero directly boundary conditions. And then you insert a Neumann piece of length twice epsilon located at the point S on the boundary. And then you recompute the new Green's function or the new Zaremba function, Z sub F. So the asymptotic statement is the difference between Z sub F and the original starting Green's function is um, minus epsilon squared times a constant times the normal derivative of the Green's function times the Green's function. And you're evaluating the normal at the point S. And then you have some, some small terms. So the item to focus on is this product right here. This does not depend on the location of the Neumann piece right now. So this is just based on the Green's function associated with the pure Dirichlet problem. And so you're going to try to locate the point S so that this product becomes extremal. So it's just an optimization over the location of S. There's exactly the same boundary condition for all of the points in this optimization. It's a very low dimensional optimization. It's very fast. So this is how we locate where to start the process of growing the Neumann piece. So once you've decided where you're going to stick the Neumann piece, you have to grow it. So now we're going to fix the location and we're just going to extend the Neumann piece from there. This is where um, you have to work a little harder. 
So the monotonicity result states that if you add Neumann boundary pieces, that shifts the spectrum. So if I start with the original problem with zero Dirichlet everywhere, I'm going to pick the first mode, the first Dirichlet eigenmode, which is bigger than the target frequency. And then I'm going to keep extending the Neumann boundary pieces so that this eigen mode or this eigenvalue moves close to the target. So the red pieces in my spectrum will shift to the light blue pieces as I keep adding Neumann boundary conditions. And I'm going to keep trying to do this until I get close to the target frequency in green. So well, this means that I have to compute eigenvalues. Um, and the way I'm going to do this for this mixed Dirichlet Neumann eigen problem is through a boundary integral approach, as mentioned. And why do I do this? Um, there's a few reasons. So I, I favor the boundary integral approach because we need highly accurate eigenvalues. Um, more crucially, the eigenfunctions associated with the mixed Dirichlet Neumann problem, they could have low regularity as you approach the junction, even if you have a smooth domain. So even say on the disk, if you put a little part as Dirichlet and the rest as Neumann or the other way around, as you move in towards the Dirichlet Neumann junction, you lose smoothness. We want the scheme to be efficient. So we don't want to be adding more degrees of freedom to resolve these eigenvalues and eigenfunctions than we need. And most critically, I don't actually need the eigenfunctions. Um, in all of this business, at most, I'm interested in the value of the eigenfunctions at two points and the eigenvalues. I don't need the eigenfunctions in the entirety of the interior. So I, there's no real reason to do a volumetric calculation. So the approach that we've uh, deployed uh, in the past with some success is to replace with a single layer ansatz. So I'm going to write the eigenmodes in terms of a single layer. And the density phi on the boundary is what I then look for. So you have the standard boundary integral operators. You have the single layer. You have the adjoint of the double layer. And then using the jump conditions, what you want to locate are the characteristic values of this operator A, which combines the single layer uh, for points that are on the directly part of the boundary. And this combination of the adjoint of the double layer and the jump for the rest. So in other words, I'm looking for um, the characteristic value mu and the eigen density psi so that uh, the single layer is zero on the directly part. And this should be a psi, not a phi. Um, so the jump plus the adjoint of the double layer is zero on the Neumann part. The characteristic value mu is related to the eigenvalue of the Zaremba problem through the square. So in, in, a, in a single shot, um, if you tell me where to put the Neumann piece of the boundary, the problem has reduced to finding the characteristic value mu and the density phi so that, um, well, phi and mu are related to the operator A in the obvious fashion. So what I have achieved through this is reducing a volumetric calculation for an eigenproblem. So this problem, which is posed for all points x in the domain, I reduce it to solving for the eigendensity and the eigenmode mu on the boundary. So there's a dimensional reduction here. It comes at the cost, perhaps, of going from sparse matrices to dense matrices. Um, 
On the other hand, if it's done carefully, the payoff is worth it. It's really worth it. And here's a, a small example. So on a disk, for, for instance, if I, if I use the approach that um, we developed in previous work, we use a spectral collocation approach for the boundary integral operators. Suppose I were to prescribe zero Neumann on half the circle and zero Dirichlet on the rest. And I were to look for the 18th eigenvalue, say. Well, the degrees of freedom all live on the boundary. Uh, the location of the degrees of freedom are illustrated over here. So you can see it's, um, it's like a Chebyshev mesh on each part. There's a couple of different ways to solve for the eigenvalues. Um, they are differentiated by whether you're using a Fourier continuation-based quadrature or whether you're using a graded mesh quadrature. <clears throat> On the right, I show you the error in the 18th eigenvalue. So with a thousand points on the boundary, you get 15 digits. Um, and if you were to use a graded mesh solver, again, you get um, 10 to the minus nine in error. So with a very few number of boundary points, you can actually resolve the eigenvalues to very, very high accuracy. So we're happy with the eigenvalue solver, but um, the way it's going to be used is every time we change the boundary conditions, I'm going to have to solve for the eigenvalues. So this is still too much. We, we still want to reduce the number of times I call the high accuracy eigensolver. Because remember, we're going to be doing this within an optimization. So this is where we're going to now deploy some kind of asymptotic expansion. And the idea is to only grow the Neumann piece a little bit at a time. So here's, here's the idea. Suppose I had the boundary integral formulation for the eigenvalues um, corresponding to this setup. So I've got directly everywhere except on this place um, right here, this hatched blue segment, that's where I have zero Neumann. And clearly the, the operator, the boundary integral operator depends on this variable F, which is the characteristic function of the Neumann piece. Well, let me then add a little bit or change the Dirichlet conditions a little bit or on a small piece, this light blue piece. So I've gone from F, this region here, to F union with the characteristic function of this new piece. And the integral operator has changed from A to A sub epsilon, where epsilon is the length of the new piece. In both cases, I'm looking for the characteristic values. I'm looking for the values K, which render these operators um, singular, if you will. So kj without the new piece changes to kj epsilon after insertion of the new piece. And the question is, are these values close? So there's a generalized Richet's theorem, which is very nice. Um, so if you have two operators which are meromorphic in the complex plane, and they are somehow close in a neighborhood, then within that neighborhood, um, both the original operator and A plus S will have the same total number of characteristic values and folds. So it's a counting of zeros and folds equivalent of functions. Here it's for operators. So if the characteristic values of A are in red, then adding this operator S will shift everything, um, but it won't shift it by much. So the generalized argument principle and the generalized Richet's theorem are what we use. So um, if you have uh, a normal operator valued object A in the complex plane, then 
um, there's a couple of different statements. You can count the number of characteristic values and poles within a domain. That's the argument principle. And you can count the number of, um, eigen, of characteristic values and poles of the shifted operator A plus S provided S is close. And what we mean by close is um, A inverse applied to S should be smaller than one in the operator norm. So our integral operator, the combination of the single layer on the Dirichlet piece and the adjoint of the double layer plus the jump on the rest, that's analytic and Fred Holm of index zero. So if you start with some configuration and then you change the Dirichlet boundary condition to Neumann on a small piece of length twice epsilon, then the amount by which you shift the characteristic values can be described through this contour interval. And it's very nice. Um, the one downside is you have to integrate the inverse of the operator around the contour. So this is not super useful because I have to invert a boundary integral operator um, as I go around a contour. So it works, but it's expensive. So can I do better? Can I make an approximation that's valid and cheaper to work with? So the answer is yes. Um, and the statement is the following. So provided I have a simple eigenvalue, so a simple characteristic value, then I can find, or there exists a length epsilon and a neighborhood in the complex plane of this characteristic value so that when I increase the Neumann piece by twice epsilon, then the jth characteristic value um, is also within a neighborhood, a small neighborhood of the original one. There are no other characteristic values that come in there. So I shift the spectrum only a little bit. And there's an asymptotic expansion. So the difference in the characteristic values can be written down as something that's an integral that only depends on the unshifted operator and something that's small. So why is this useful? Well, I can just work with the bit that's order one. Um, if I had a good approximation of the characteristic value, without the insertion of the new bit, I can get a very good approximation to where that eigenvalue moves using one matrix assembly and inversion of the operator at one point. And then I just do a trapezoidal rule. So this quantity here doesn't change as omega changes. So I'm going around the contour in the complex plane. I don't have to do this inversion or this matrix inversion more than once. So this allows me to change the, the Neumann pieces without actually redoing the eigenvalue calculation uh, as I grow the length of the Neumann piece. So I can do this in steps of up to twice epsilon and I only need to do a recalculation of eigenvalues once I've drifted beyond a certain tolerance. So once my eigenvalues have moved by some tolerance, I say, okay, now I'm not sure I should use the asymptotic expression anymore. Let me recalculate the eigenvalues um, using the integral approach. So here's a sketch of the algorithm. Um, you give me the domain omega, the target frequency k star, and the fixed source receiver pair. I'm going to start by first computing the pure Dirichlet eigenvalue corresponding to k star, such that it's um, bigger than the target frequency. The first eigenvalue for the Dirichlet problem that's bigger than the target frequency. Then I'm going to find the location S on the boundary where I can nucleate the Neumann bit. So I'm going to 
determine the location S so that it optimizes using the order epsilon squared approximation um, for where the location should be. And then once I fix the location, I'm going to grow the Neumann piece. And that's that's going to be using the generalized argument principle. And that's where the eigenvalue calculations will be done. So does this all work? Um, well, yeah. Um, I performed the high accuracy eigenvalue calculations for some partitions. And then I can keep growing the Neumann piece wherever I can using the asymptotic formula. And so let's say I were on the unit disk and I fixed the source at the origin and I had the receiver um, at the point, let's say zero comma R, where R is some variable that's allowed to vary between zero and one. So I'm going to show you results for different locations of the receiver. And the idea here is um, where you place the Neumann piece and how long it gets depends very much on the location of the receiver. That seems reasonable. Uh, what you're optimizing is the value of the signal at a given point. But of course, it must depend on where that point is. So what I've got here is the original value of the, the signal due to the source at that point, there should be a Y star for different values of R. So where I place the receiver will tell me how big my Green's function is. And then after I'm done with the optimization, here are the values of the, the Green's function. So this is for the mixed problem after optimization. The location of the Neumann pieces are indicated here in this row right here and the length of the segment. So what's interesting here is, of course, um, not the first two digits, which I've described, but slightly more digits. The gain is the important thing. So you can increase the ratio of the, the unmodified Green's function to the optimized Green's function by a lot, by a factor of say 80,000, depending on where you are. So here's visually what happened. So I placed the source at this point here in, in the center. And say I were trying to optimize the signal at the receiver right here. By modifying the Neumann data, so I'm inserting a Neumann piece, say, somewhere here on the boundary, I can boost the signal. And I don't care if the, about the sign. It doesn't matter. I'm interested in the magnitude of the change. So I can boost the signal considerably through the insertion of the Neumann pieces. So this is when the target frequency is quite low. Does it work when the target frequency is higher? Um, yes. So I take a wave number of about 15, and then I repeat this process. So once again, for different source receiver pairs, you can figure out where the where the Neumann piece of the boundary should go and how long it should be. And here it's a little clearer to see that oops, the location of the Neumann piece will depend very much on where the source and receivers are. And again, you can achieve um, gain by changing the length and the location of the Neumann piece. And so here, you can see that if you had directly all around, you're going to get the Green's function corresponding to uh, the Helmholtz operator with zero directly conditions. And then if you insert a small Neumann piece on top, then you can change the signal at the receiver. And that quite dramatically changes the field. Um, a question that I've heard before, uh, I've received before is, does this only work if your domain's convex? And the answer is no. So we did this for the so-called kite-shaped domain. So uh, you've got this kite-shaped region where you put the source in one lobe of the kite and your receiver is in the other lobe. And in between, you've got directly all around. 
So again, you don't need a whole lot of discretization points around the boundary to resolve eigenvalues. Uh, we use um, about 200 points. And once you're done with the optimization, the Neumann piece has been inserted at the bottom. I'm not sure you can see, but the field changes at the bottom, which is where you want it to change. Your receiver is right here in this corner, right here. And so the value has changed considerably in magnitude and the gain can be in this example of the order of 10 to the five. You could do this again for higher frequencies or higher wave numbers. So you, again, your target frequency has increased. Uh, once again, your source receiver pair are in these locations right here. And by inserting the Neumann piece, this time you're inserting it up here, um, you can boost the signal at the receiver. All right. So that sort of brings me to the end of my talk. Um, there's a lot of little moving parts in here, but the gist of it is we're trying to enhance the amplitude of a wave for a time harmonic problem at a given receiver location due to a given source at a fixed location. The frequency of the time harmonic wave is fixed. We achieve the optimization by changing boundary conditions. And we perform the optimization through a spectral optimization. The way we do this inexpensively is by combining um, the generalized argument principle, some potential theory, and um, a high accuracy solve for the eigenvalues. One very interesting question which arises and which we're looking at now is the way we've done it at present, we nucleate the Neumann boundary condition at one piece and just grow it from there. But there's no reason why you shouldn't have more than one Neumann piece is being inserted. So how would you extend this approach to the situation where you have more than one Neumann segment? Uh, that remains to be done. And with that, um, I will take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nima. Quite an interesting talk. Um, if you have questions, please uh, raise your hand or put a word in the chat box and uh, I, will be, I will be very happy to uh, uh, unmute you. Uh, so uh, don't be shy about asking questions. Uh, we have a little time. We have a little time after five, even after the recording is over. So, uh, um, and since in this business, uh, uh, somebody has to start, so I'd be happy to start also so just to uh, uh, launch a conversation. Um, I have actually several questions, but uh, um, um, I was wondering whether, uh, so in, in, in the methods that you use uh, to uh, uh, define what would be the proper length of the greens part of the boundary, mm -hmm. uh, um, so you you get to a certain level uh, of eigenvalue in of the Dirichlet of the free Dirichlet problem, mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. just uh, go down mm -hmm. uh, using that mono monotonicity argument. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you know how far down you can get a priori? Uh, is there a bound? Mm -hmm. How much you can? Uh, uh, how close to K star could you uh, could you could you achieve? That? That's a very good question. Um... I don't know, because and there's, the reason for this is, of course, the eigenvalues are very sensitive to many things. They're very sensitive to the shape of the domain. Mm -hmm. They're very sensitive to the, um, the presence of corners, as you might imagine. So I have not yet seen a theorem that allows me to say how close I'm going to get to the target frequency. Um, for a fixed domain. Okay. Uh, but it's a, it's a great question. Right. I don't know. I don't know how far I can push the domain monotonicity this way. Uh -huh. And speaking of bounds, uh, would you also know a priori uh, uh, how much of a gain could you get on <laughs> the uh, on these z phi divided by uh, uh, z f or the, uh, I think these are related questions, actually. So the closer I can get to the target frequency, the higher the gain is going to be. 
Okay, certainly. Yeah. Right. Um, and since a priori, I don't know exactly how close I can get, uh, at least using this approach. It's hard to say blindly how much. You can yeah. perhaps see, let's see if I can say in this example. So I've got the kite. I've got the same fixed locations for the source and the, and the receiver. So okay. the, I fixed the domain, I fixed the source, I fixed the receiver. All that changed in this problem is the target frequency. Okay. In one case, I'm able to achieve a gain of 10 to the five. And for the higher frequency, the gain is still, is still non-zero or non-one, but it's not 10 to the five. Okay. <laughs> right. So I think if I picked a slightly different wave number K star, I might get a different gain. But it, it's a very good question, Eric, and I don't know how to answer it right now. And do you expect a higher gain for lower frequencies? I don't have any particular reason to believe that. Okay. Mm -mm. I think it depends on how close I can get to it. All right, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, uh, I'm chatting the chat box, so uh, don't be shy. And, uh, uh, if you have questions, uh, any kind of questions, uh, <laughs> please feel free to, to ask. Uh, and, uh, oh, well, I, I have uh, one question, maybe. Yes, Michael. Uh, 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 yes, uh, thank, thank you for your interesting talk. So um, your starting location S seems mm -hmm. to be pretty unique is all, because to, to me this optimization problem, and as long as you start this initial location, you will grow mm -hmm. your Lorman boundary condition. So mm -hmm. it, seems, it seems that the problem is the identification of this starting point is very important. Indeed. And also, I, Indeed. I guess that would be also, is it a, a almost an optimal solution or around this location for this for your problem? Otherwise, you may consider another location that may mm -hmm. give you a, uh, another good point, and so so I I just uh, curious about about this also maybe related to what you say if you have a more than one right. segment, correct? Yeah. Actually, this is a, a very very good question. So let let me skip back. Um, this is a deep question, and it's um, let's see where to go. Yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah. So what we've done is we've got an initial optimization mm. problem in which you're optimizing the location and the length. Mm. We have split this optimization now into two stages. One is where we optimize the location and then we optimize the length. But you're absolutely correct. There is no... Um, there's no reason that you couldn't improve the objective function by having, say, two different locations and then growing differently. So we've chosen a particular path in um, our state space to try to optimize. Right? We're not doing a one-shot optimization. So the one-shot optimization would be um, Together, I locate the location and the length. So at each step, I change both. Mm -hmm. But that's not what we're doing here. So what we're doing here is indeed, we're picking a particular path in state space. We fix a location first, and then we grow. But maybe the maximum that we get that way is not the, not the global optimizer. Mm -hmm. That's a possibility. Yeah. <laughs> I think in the earlier paper, uh, around me, they, they haven't shown about any uh, optimizer. I mean, the global optimizer, something no, like that. They, no, they haven't. No, yeah, no there's, there is no, I'm, I'm not asserting that I'm actually getting to the global optimizer. I'm, I'm getting to a local maximizer mm. in this direction of my search. I see. Um, yeah. yeah. It's actually really, it's a fantastic question, right? So, yeah. yeah. Um, it's not a priori clear to me why you should have one piece or two pieces or n pieces of 
the Neumann data. Um, it's not a priori clear to me how long those pieces should be. So if you think about this problem and all its possible generality, it's almost intractable. Okay. In, in the formula you're showing here uh, on the screen, you have yeah. an epsilon square as a narrow term. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that dimension dependent? This, yes, it, it, I think this is dimension de uh, dependent. I don't know what the, I don't know what the result looks like in three dimensions, but yes, I, I think that has to be a dimension dependent. Okay, all right, mm -hmm. okay. okay. And uh, uh, another question uh, also in this direction, uh, you're looking at the Helmholtz equation, you have a yes. target frequency, but does that hold also for free, uh, zero frequency? Ooh, uh, with just a uh, uh, conduction equation. It should. I mean, you'd still have a spectral characterization. So you'd still be able to, um, it should. Okay. It should. Mm -hmm. So you would try to shift the, Instead of the nth eigenvalue, you would shift the smallest one. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, so you mentioned this result of uh, monotonicity, mm -hmm. uh, which looks quite nice indeed. Uh, mm -hmm. Does that hold also when you have corners? For instance, uh, you have a gamma n and a gamma prime n, and uh, one is the, uh, contains the corners, the other doesn't. Uh, so in the paper, um, let's see, uh, the monotonicity result by, um, from 2017. That's so it. in this paper, there seems to be, um, it seems to be stated in great generality. And so it was stated for Lipschitz domains. Um, and the rest of the paper is for polyhedral or polygonal domains, but this state, the, the statement of this particular theorem was for Lipschitz domains and I could not, see any particular reason why you needed any smoothness beyond like piece, piecewise C1, say. I see. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and did yeah. you make, make any, uh, did you try uh, this uh, algorithm you presented on uh, domains with corners? Yes, yes, uh -huh. uh, we did. Um, I should have included the results. Yeah, it, it works. It works, and, and you're not going particularly to the corner. Uh, I mean, this is point S that you're making doesn't always come to go to a corner. Or... In the few experiments that we tried, we did not need to nucleate at the corner. Uh -huh. But then again, it's very dependent on the setup, right? So if yeah, the target frequency the... shifts, I might need to nucleate there. I don't know. Um, for the for the Lipschitz domains, it's actually quite interesting. So if I had if I had a, a Neumann piece of the boundary meeting the Dirichlet piece of the boundary at an angle that was not pi by two, say. So suppose it was an acute angle. Um, the eigenvalues are actually uh, easier to calculate than if um, I were doing a polygonal domain calculation where they met at 180 degrees. And that's because the singularity at the corner, oh, it, at the junction depends on twice the angle. Okay, yeah. Right. Right. So. Okay. Well, I guess Michael and I are the only ones to ask questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to be, to be, yeah. to be uh, uh, anyway, um, I can stop sharing. Yeah. Can just look at the things I noted on. If I had any other, uh, oh yeah, I had a, a, a question concerning uh, the various uh, physical sets of, of those things. Uh, you said you could monitor. Uh, uh, you, you could place these devices that would produce the effect of the Green's mm -hmm. uh, Neumann boundary condition. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you go also into uh, an impedance type uh, boundary condition? Uh, see, uh, uh, I, 
So that's a very good question. I believe so. So, um, but I, I should preface this by saying, this is my reading of the paper, the, the, the physical setup. This is my reading of it, but I believe so. So the idea there is you've got these uh, surfaces with sub wavelength features in them. Okay. And then you set, you have this nice setup of resonators. So you have like a few resonators and then you fix one and then you can vary the other ones, turn them on or off. And then <clears throat> if your sampling frequency is close to the resonance of the collection, then you get either directly or Neumann, you know, depending on whether it's on or off. But if you're away from it, I think it is an impedance boundary condition. This was my reading of the, of the, the work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and those devices you can also use them on on degrees much smaller lengths than, mm -hmm. than the associated frequency with which you're going to emit from X star to Y star, right? Yeah. <laughs> which means that you're free to uh, uh, really finely tune what what you uh, impose mm -hmm. on the country. Indeed. Uh -huh. Indeed. Um, so the experiment itself, uh, the experimental setup itself is quite fascinating. And I wish I were a, an experimentalist, you know, so I could ask harder questions, but at least based on the paper, okay. uh, it's quite magical. You can, you can achieve very fine tuning of the field inside the cavity by changing these resonator setups. So it's, it's quite impressive. Uh, uh -huh. Well, one can see on the numerics you showed that it's yeah. completely distorted, and uh, yeah, and yeah, it, it's uh, it's amazing. It's, it it is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Nina. Uh, well, thank you so much, Eric, and thank you, Michael.